touched on it some already in our studies. It makes a distinction between the church of our Lord and the kingdom of our Lord. The theory goes, and I may say a false theory, that the Lord came to establish his kingdom. The Jews would not accept him, so he couldn't establish it. So he set up the church as some kind of afterthought. And that he will come back yet in our future sometime. And he will come back to this earth. <clears throat> there are variations on the theory there according to the religion at least. And he will rule a literal thousand years. Some, of course, say it's sitting on his throne in Jerusalem. Others, like Joe's Witness, say he will be in heaven with a literal 144,000. And the rest of Joe's Witness will be on earth. And it will be a Garden of Eden, and that's where they will continue to live. Whatever the case, we're zeroing in, although there are many facets of this that's contrary to the Bible. We're zeroing in on the idea that the church is the kingdom, and the kingdom is the church. The Lord, in promising to build his church, used those terms interchangeably, referring to the same institution in Matthew 16. And when you study the scriptures, obeying Paul and his statement to Timothy of rightly dividing the word of truth, you'll see that the view of a thousand-year reign, as I described it, and the various other things concerning the kingdom and the church being distinct institutions will be false. Now, we're including this in our study of the identifying marks of the Lord's church. Which identifying marks are found in the last will and testament of Jesus Christ, which is the second part of the Bible, known as the New Testament, made up of 27 books. So I want us to understand that the kingdom of Christ has been established. I mentioned this past Wednesday and on other occasions that the Jew who was faithful in the days covered by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who studied the Old Testament and especially passages or books like Daniel, would have known that they were living in the days when God was going to set up his kingdom and not implied a king because you cannot have a kingdom without at least a king. So Daniel, in recalling Nebuchadnezzar's dream and interpreting that dream, said in verse 44 of Daniel chapter 2, and we in the church ought to have that book, chapter, and verse, at least in our mind, if not memorized. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Later he says, it shall stand forever. Daniel 2.44. They knew they were living in the days of those kings. They could read and understand and count the kingdoms that Daniel interpreted in the great figure. They could understand that they were living in that fourth kingdom and yet as I said also here sometime back it pointed more exactly to that time when John the baptizer who was sent by God to prepare the way of his son came during the days of those kings preaching repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand Matthew 3 1 and 2 at hand is like this water bottle right here is at hand. It's close by. As I say, they could read Daniel. They could understand it. They could know where they are in the unfolding of these things in history. They would have recognized, having known the Bible, that Malachi closes with the idea that one would precede the coming of the Messiah. And after John had been put in prison, we find that Jesus preached in Mark 1, verse 15, the time is fulfilled. To fulfill something, you fill it full. 
you have a glass full filled, you can't put any more if it's water in that glass. So the time's fulfilled. Now, Paul said concerning the coming of Christ that in the fullness of time God sent forth his son. But remember, he's the king. The king must come to establish his kingdom. So when he talks about the kingdom, the time for it being fulfilled, then he's actually having to refer to both of them. Jesus later taught the disciples to pray in his model prayer, Matthew 6, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. At the time that he taught that to his disciples, the kingdom was not yet there. It is important also to note, while it's a model to follow, once the kingdom comes, you don't just recite this prayer saying, Thy kingdom come. Context means you have to look at the time that he gave them that prayer. And the Lord's kingdom had not yet come. Christ taught that the kingdom was to come during the very lifetime of some of those disciples living at that time. Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, our Lord said, There are some here of them that stand by, who shall in no wise taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. A little simple thinking here, if you're not wedded to a false doctrine so much, you'll ignore it, makes it clear that either the kingdom has been established or else there's some disciples who are a little bit on the aged side because they would still have to be alive if the Lord's true to his word, and he is. And I might say, in comparison to Methuselah, these folks would be just uh, babes. In Matthew 18, 3, the disciples had not yet entered the kingdom. So Jesus said, except ye repent or turn and become as little children, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is still in his earthly ministering, ministry. Ministry. Conditioning the minds, teaching the proper attitude toward God and His Word so that they would be able to receive the gospel in its fullness when it was preached such as we read of in Acts 2. You'll remember also that Jesus in sending out the 70 in Luke 10, 9 said the kingdom of God is come nigh which means near unto you. That is, it's soon to be established. But at the end of his life, when he had observed the Passover and out of it instituted the Lord's Supper, we learned that it was still in the future. That is the kingdom. Because he says in Luke chapter 22 and verse 18, after he had said the fruit of the vine represented his blood, shed for many for the remission of sins. I shall not drink from henceforth of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Now that was on the very night before his crucifixion and death on the following day. Now from the study of the scriptures, the right division of the word, can we learn more specifically about the time of the kingdom's establishment. Now you remember what we read in Mark 9, 1. The kingdom of God was to come with power. You further recall that this power was to come upon the apostles as they obeyed the Lord's command to tarry in Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. Luke 24, 49. And with the coming of the Holy Spirit on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ there in Jerusalem, they received power, Acts 2, 1 through 4. If anything stands out there, and there are several things that do, but one of them is that the Holy Spirit came upon them, and we call it the baptismal measure of power of the Holy Spirit, and endowed them with the ability to speak in tongues they had never studied. 
There were other signs, such as the sound of a rushing mighty wind, but there was no wind, and it sounded like it was coming from heaven down to earth, but there just wasn't a wind. The cloven tongue sitting on each one of the apostles, all those things, cloven tongues like as in the fire, were signs. Then they're speaking those languages that Galileans certainly would never study, much less a lot of other people in a formal relationship or atmosphere. And when I put those simple things together, being serious about the study of the Bible, then one of the marks of the Lord's kingdom being here is that when you put these together, the sum of thy word is truth. We see the kingdom came on that Pentecost as Luke records in Acts chapter 2. Now, somebody says, well, there are a lot of details in this doctrine of premillennialism, and there's different views even among them. You don't have to know all those views. To know enough to know is totally false. I remember well Brother G.K. Wallace telling me in a debate, he said, now, you know, if you've got a train, it has the engine pulling it, it has 100 cars behind it. He says, you don't have to knock the wheels out from every one of those cars, including the engine, to derail it. All you have to do is knock the front wheels out from under the engine. So there are certain basic tenets of this false doctrine, as there are many other different doctrines that are false, that when you deal with it, the others cannot stand. No matter how diverse and strange they may be as they go from person to person who believe some sort of premillennialism. You'll remember back in the Lord promising to build his church where he used the word church and kingdom interchangeably to talk about the same institution. That he told Peter, I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. That means uh, authority. The person with the keys has the authority. And when you look at what Jesus said with the work of the Holy Spirit with the apostles to enable them to do the work he called them to do as apostles of Christ, ambassadors of the court of heaven, John chapters 14, 15, and 16, you will see when you read what the Holy Spirit had Luke record, Peter's sermon on that first Pentecost, you'll see quickly that he had the keys to the kingdom. And when people were led by proof to believe that Christ is the Messiah and that they had put the one to death that they had been looking for, they were pricked in their heart. They cried unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he took them as believers and said, notice the unlocking of the door to the kingdom, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and your children, and to all them that be afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Well, the call is the gospel call, which Christ is commissioned to be preached to every creature, Mark 16, 16. Thus, it's God's power to save them from sin, but they must hear it, Romans 1, 16. And thus, the church is charged with preaching it, and the identifying marks of the Lord's church, his kingdom, are found in the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, the terms, the keys, the terms of admission into the kingdom of Christ were used. And the conditions of salvation were laid out to all men, and they're the same today as they were then. Acts 2 and verse 41 tells us plainly, Then they that received his word were baptized, and there were added unto them in that day about 3,000 souls. So they became members of the church, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Now some years after that Pentecost day, we find Paul writing that they had been certain ones, which would be all members of the church, had been translated into the kingdom. He said that to the Colossian brethren in chapter 1 in verse 13. Who delivered us out of the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of God's dear Son. The American Samuel simply says the kingdom of the Son of His love. 
You'll also see in that first chapter, and you need to read it just to see it for yourself, that he mentions by the time he wrote the Colossian epistle that the gospel had been preached to the whole world. That is, all men had had the opportunity by that time to become Christians if they really wanted to. So the future kingdom error falls flat on its face. They were in the kingdom. That was almost 2,000 years ago. But the doctrine says it's yet in our future. Makes a distinction between the kingdom of Christ and the church. And I always wondered about this. If the Jews not believing in Christ, so the theory goes, when he first came caused him not to be able to build his kingdom, then what if they won't believe him when he comes back the second time? Will he have to set up some other institution besides the church? Or will, well, who knows what he'll do. They just preach it as if, oh no, they're all going to believe. Well, how do they know that? Besides that, the theory on its own, I guess you'd say foundation is flawed. So the absurdity of the theory is again seen when the inspired writer of the Hebrews, it may have been Paul, writing Jews who were citizens of the kingdom, members of the church, who were being tempted to leave it, was saying things to them that said, basically, where are you going to go? The Old Testament pointed you to Christ. You found him. You believed and obeyed the gospel. Now, if you give this up, there's nothing else left for you, but really the judgment of God condemning you. But in Hebrews 12 and verse 28, as he exhorts them and admonishes them, he says, wherefore, receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The kingdom was to stand forever. So the prophecy of Daniel 2.44 says, though no wonder all those many, many years down through the centuries, inspired by the Hebrews, inspired by the same spirit that inspired Daniel, said this is that kingdom that will stand forever. It cannot be shaken. So if we've received a kingdom that stands forever, then it cannot end to let another begin. So where's there any room for a kingdom in our future? There's not. So no kingdom can be established in the future according to the rightly divided word of God. Now if you want to get into the speculative theories of mere men who have some reason to do what they do and won't receive the truth, there's no end to where you can go on that. Brethren, let me throw this in parenthetically about the Lord's church. You know, we have no central headquarters on earth. Each congregation is autonomous from every other congregation. And when set up according to the New Testament pattern, you have elders to oversee it, deacons to serve, evangelists to preach, teachers to teach, members to serve and do all those things that God would have citizens of the kingdom, members of the church, members of the body of Christ to do. Now, when you consider that, what else is there for a kingdom to do on this earth that has not yet been set up. As far as I know, best I can tell, there is none. We're doing it right now as faithful citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Yet, because we have no central headquarters, it says, now if you're a member of the church of Christ, you must meet this doctrine, this doctrine, this doctrine, this doctrine, and you're considered faithful. Watch it, brethren. When members of the church apostatize, leave the various items of doctrine in the New Testament, there is no telling where they're going to wind up. For they have no earthly headquarters and hierarchy to reel them in and say, no, if you're going to be a part of this church, you must believe this. That's the reason that you can't just say because any church out here in our area, this state, this nation in the world that has Church of Christ on its marquee above the door, that those who make it up are what they ought to be. 
There may have been a time, and I don't doubt there was, I think I lived through part of it, to where you could maybe, quote, assume that to be the case more than ever. But in reality, there never has been a time when you could just go down the road and there it said Church of Christ, well, we know they're going to be everything the New Testament says the church ought to be. You always are charged with testing and trying the spirits to see whether they be of God. And that was said while the New Testament was being written and the church hadn't been on this, church, this world in years. Apostles were still on this earth. And yet you read through your New Testament and the church was already in the process of departing and being warned that it was going to depart. For some reason, if Church of Christ is above the door and they baptize folks, maybe you can't even find out for sure where they believe they have to know exactly what they need to know to be baptized scripturally. Brethren will just run anywhere. But you won't find that in your Bible and I don't care what preacher from any school or wherever he may be from, he can't find it either. And you know, we're not going to be judged by what the majority thinks or the most wealthy think or the most educated or even the most ignorant or people in our family or whatever else. We're going to be judged without prejudice by the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the final and complete revelation of God to man. And so when you begin to go around today with the mess that we all recognize has moved us off the foundations of morality in this country, why do you think the church is not going to be touched by those things? Tell me a doctrine that is peculiar to being a faithful Christian in the Lord's church that doesn't have error taught about it. Just tell me one. Lord's Supper? The kind of music God wants? Prayer, the Holy Spirit, His working? On and on you can go. If the Lord authored it and revealed it and said you must do it, then the devil's come along and guess what he's done? He's counterfeited. He said this will do. You'd think we would know that when you just read about his confrontation with Eve. Thou shalt not surely die. She knew God said you eat this thing, you're going to die. And the devil just said, thou shalt not. And when you look around you, it seems that some of the most radical, crazy doctrines are the ones that appeal to most people. Some of you are old enough to remember Jim Jones back in Guyana. And I, all those people, this list of them took poison, died by the hundreds. No, no. That wouldn't happen to me. Well, you may not drink some sort of concoction that actually kills your physical body, but this spiritual false doctrine spewed out of most congregations, and I don't just mean the Lord's church, I mean religious institutions, throughout this whole nation. And people sit there just lapping it up, killing them spiritually, lickety split. That's one of those really highfalutin words. It means real fast. But we don't seem to think we should be concerned. Oh, you're just making a big mountain out of molehill. Brethren, there are people teaching this stuff. It divided the Lord's church in the 20s and the 30s. Do you realize that? In fact, Foy Wallace, his debates with false brethren on this, can be given most of the credit for shutting the door on them. And you can still find those debates, although that costs you some money to get them. We don't know our history. We don't know what went on. We just get the idea that everything as it is right now is going to go right ahead and just keep on keeping on. But it's not. It never has. And if Paul could say to the Ephesian elders that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, how fast did it happen? Pretty fast. Secular history says that within 100 years, in the eldership, one man was elevated to have more authority than the other elders. And later, he would be called a bishop, which always had more authority than the others. Do you know how that started? Because people had to make a living then, just like they have to make a living now, and elders did too. 
So they would designate one to be around all the time so he could take care of protecting them from false doctrine. So that one was there all along and in time men getting further away from the teachings of the scriptures gave him more power than the other elders. There was a chief elder, then a bishop. Then as the church went corrupted more and more and more, there came then the metropolitan bishop who was over every church in that metropolis. And finally, and all sorts of other things that took place in departure from the divine pattern, you had Roman Catholicism forming out of that great apostasy. And so you have the Bishop of Rome who still sits there this day, supposedly in the place of Peter, and thus he, as their doctrine teaches falsely, is the Prince of the Apostles, and thus he rules over all. That even caused the division in the old Catholic Church. That's where the Eastern Orthodox Church came from. They would not submit to the Western Church idea that the Pope Rome had the authority. They wouldn't do it at all. So they went the other direction and followed the patriarch. Now they're just as messed up going away from the Bible as the Roman Catholics are, but they even divided among themselves. And that was a long, long time ago now. So what have we concluded? The kingdom of Jesus Christ started on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ in the city of Jerusalem. Exactly. Was it 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning on that Pentecost of long ago? Peter preached to them at Jerusalem and the church of Christ began, we know. Now, you know, we have our young people learn that. We better know it's taught by the Bible. And since the church is the kingdom, we could equally say the kingdom of Christ began, we know. The body of Christ began, we know. Well, our time has run out for this morning. I'm going to continue as I did last week with some other things about this false doctrine of premillennialism and understanding better how the church is the kingdom and the kingdom is the church. As an identifying mark found in the New Testament, given to us as one among many that we've been studying so we could recognize in our day and any day the Lord's church and in planting churches through the preaching of the gospel that we can teach the truth to everybody because the truth will always make you free, John 8, 31 and 32. We studied this morning what one must do in order to become a Christian, a member of that church, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. If as a child of God, a Christian, you have sinned, then the second law of pardon is to repent of that sin. Turn from it. Confess it. Pray God for forgiveness. God is loving. God will hear. And he will forgive. Let's never forget that God wants us to be in heaven with him. That he loves us and is giving us time to order our lives according to the New Testament pattern. Let's take advantage of that time. We don't know when it's going to end. And this is the time of probation time we had to prove to him we love him we have faith in him and his son and the whole gospel system if you're subject to the gospel call then we invite you to come while we stand and sing